Well, a very warm welcome to Portobello and Joppa Parish Church, formerly known as St. Philip's. We've gathered here on a beautiful and a wonderful afternoon at the beginning of February to celebrate and give thanks for John Cook's life, for all that he did here at this church and the way that he affected so many people. We have a whole cast of motley characters down here who will be sharing with us some of their irreverent and reverent thoughts and how appropriate that is because of the effect that John had on so many people here and in the wider community. It will most certainly be a service of laughter, of fun, of celebration, and of thanksgiving for the family, for the church community, and for the community at large. So let us begin by singing John's favorite hymn, It is I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. The words should be up on the screen, and for those of you who remember this hymn, remember there's that little bit of a pause at one bit, so we don't want you singing solo when everybody else has remembered that they should just pause. I, the Lord of Sea and Sky.
Today, when you go out looking for a, a minister, uh, it's a lot different from the time that we found John. Uh, the Church of Scotland has sort of streamlined things for the 21st century, and uh, you, you form a nominating committee these days rather than a vacancy committee. Um, you place adverts for the vacant charge, um, and you expect the people that you have shortlisted to come to you. They come, it's like a, a business interview. You sit down with them, you ask them the same questions. Each one comes in, you ask the same questions. And at the end of it, you think, okay, there's a couple of them that uh, we might all like. And then we go and listen to them preach, and then we make up our minds. That's what happened. I've had experience of that within the last two or three years. Uh, but it was very, very different nearly 30 years ago. We had a vacancy committee, and I was fortunate enough to be on the vacancy committee here at what we used to call St. Philip's, um, and it was a, a great honour to be part of that committee. We met, we advertised, but then when we got applications, and we got a lot of applications at that time, we all would head off around Scotland looking for ministers, looking at ministers that we had shortlisted. So we had little groups going off here, there, up to the north, across to the west, through really people all over Scotland, and little groups, and they go and listen to the minister. They try to be as inconspicuous as possible because clearly the minister didn't want to know you were there, and the congregation most certainly probably didn't want to know you were there as a vacancy committee. But we'd all arrive suited and booted from the big city, which was all right in a big church, but in some small churches, that we just stuck out like sore thumbs. We were clearly something that they hadn't seen normally on a Sunday. And we, we paired up, I paired up with, with a, a lady of uh, an age who might have been my wife, so that we could sit as a couple, and another couple sat over there, and another couple sat over there. In a big church, that's all right, but in a small church, not quite so easy. We traveled around Scotland, we came back, we exchanged notes, and we hadn't found anybody that really did it for us at all. And we were beginning to think, come on, this is a great church, people must come, we must get somebody really good to come along here. And then Bob Aiken, a, a, a good friend, suggested this guy who was minister in a church through in the West, John Weir Cook. And we thought, okay, um, it would be worth having a look at, we've got nothing to lose. He hadn't applied for the job. Um, and we said, well, which church is, is he at? And they said, Henderson Church, Kilmarnock, and was a sort of collective gasp by the, the vacancy committee because we had poached his predecessor at Henderson, uh, Glenn Taverner, a, a number of years before. So we thought we wouldn't be flavor of the month with Henderson pinching their other, their latest minister. But still, we went through, a small group of us went through, and fortunately it wasn't in Henderson Church because John that Sunday was preaching at a, a, a church, I think during the, my memory tells me it was in the summer and he was a sort of filling in, there was a joint service with two or three churches but not his own. And so we could fit in, we wouldn't be noticed. We came back, reported to the others and said, this guy is good. And uh, consequently another group I think went out to see him in Kilmarnock, but not in Henderson I understand. Uh, and they came back and said, yeah, he's good. Uh, so we instructed or asked the then session clerk, Jack Fubister, to contact John and say, you won't know us, but uh, I'm Jack Fubister from St. Philip's in Choppa, and uh, we wonder if you'd be interested in becoming our minister. Uh, and John I think, hadn't expected this, but we then sort of learned that John might have been at a stage in his career where he thought it would be good to move on to somewhere, sort of, uh, sort of 14, 15 years seems to be a, an agreed length of time that people stay in a charge and then feel they move on. And so he was, he was interested. He came through and met us. Uh, I think he brought the family through to, to look at the manse, which is always a, a good selling point for families, a nice, nice big manse up the road there. Saw the church and said, yes, he could well be interested. And so he was put forward as sole nominee, and of course, uh, everybody was more than happy. He was, uh, he was adopted unanimously and uh, became our minister. And it was interesting because we sort of set out as a vacancy committee saying, we want somebody who's maybe in their early 30s with a young family, you know, and they'd keep them for quite a while. We ended up with somebody who was just into his 50s 
with two teenage daughters. So it was sort of an interesting one that, uh, that we got John. And John, um, before we got him, John had been a minister in India, um, taking up his first charge at St Andrews, Calcutta. And his pastoral work took him into the foothills of the Himalayas, and he formed then a strong connection with Dr. Graham's Homes, the Kirk School for Orphans in Kalimpong. John was born in Greenock, the eldest of three brothers, Neil and Malcolm, and Neil's with us today. If you ever saw John and Neil and Malcolm together, nobody in the world would ever get a word in edgewise, because <laughs> if, if these guys could talk, these guys could talk. Uh, he was educated at Greenock Academy, the high school of Glasgow, and Glasgow University, um, where he graduated in arts before studying divinity at Trinity College. Then he won a scholarship to Princeton Theological Seminary in the USA. Now, I'm told at the time divinity students were somewhat restrained, if not quiet, sober, and sedate. <laughs> and clearly, John would be very much at home with this. <laughs> John was none of these, of course, he was gregarious, he was boisterous, he was witty, rebellious. He won the reputation of being a fine preacher, someone who could captivate any audience, however much they were expecting to be bored. Uh, he left India in 1961 and became minister of Henderson Church of Kilmarnock, and in 1988 he moved here to St. Philip's until his retirement. It was a good thing that he did answer our call, because over the years, we all got to know him very well. We got to know him as a, a student, as a teacher, as a, a wordsmith, as a listener, as a counsellor, and a consoler, and above all, a friend. And uh, I know we all miss him hugely. But I'm going to now hand on to my friend, Hunter Davis, who's going to talk about John's years here at St. Philip's. Thank you, Gavin. Right from the start, John had a gift of hitting it off with folks of all kinds and types and conditions. It meant that within the dignity and structure of his traditional approach to worship, he was able to reach across and appeal not just to regular worshippers, but also to those who would otherwise be disinclined to give the church or its way of life much time or attention. <coughs> His progressive, attractive Christianity had an inclusiveness and an acceptance at its heart. He had spiritual vitality and a willingness to question, for John was the lifelong student. He took more time than you might suppose to prepare his sermons, which were delivered with that fresh, modern interpretation of the scriptures. Several inspiring summer series of sermons were printed under titles such as Images of Christ for the 20th Century or The Journey into God. He spent a sabbatical period in Australia in the company of Peter Cameron, his predecessor here, and uh, as you might recall, uh, one of the few to be named a heretic in uh, the Australian Presbyterian Church. He regularly met with friends, John did, to study the New Testament in the original Greek. And he came with several of us each year to the annual uh, Christianity and Science lectures at the Harriet Watt University, and the only one taking notes was John Cook. For John found more grace in the search for understanding than in dogmatic certainty. He found more value in the questioning than in the absolutes. And throughout, nothing, ex nothing excluded opportunities for laughter. Do you remember the occasion when the congregation was surprised to hear a mobile phone going off during one of John's sermons? And the roar of laughter when he took the mobile from his pocket saying, <laughs> Who would have thought to ring me at this time of day or something? <laughs> His work with the Clinical, Theological, Clinical Theology Association helped support his pastoral strengths as a counsellor and parish minister. Alison Jack, 
who was his assistant for several years and is now assistant principal at New College, said of John that he taught her how to make every visit count. Take off your coat, sit forward in the chair, listen hard and give people a hug. Three particular notable events in John's time here were the three B's. Firstly, the broadcast nationwide on Christmas Day. Secondly, the blaze when fire engulfed the church. And thirdly, the battle to complete a very successful financial campaign. John's hard-headed <coughs> recruitment of a campaign manager and the feeding of the 500 in the Brunton Hall. John enjoyed his sport. He played and followed rugby, golf. He was the playing chaplain to the church men's golf club. Football, big Greenock Morton fan. And cricket, where like all small boys, he no doubt dreamt that one day he might play for Scotland. Likewise, he was a wonderful games master, playing host at the many <coughs> absorbing non-competitive games that he used to break the ice at gatherings in the manse. John had a large family and enjoyed nothing more than celebrating convivial occasions at the family house on the Isle of Arran, especially with his wife, Elizabeth and children, Peter and Sarah and Noel and their families. John was much loved, well respected. He has certainly left an inspirational mark on the Joppa consciousness. John had a very special skill which many people only realised existed after they'd been on the receiving end of it. He somehow managed to persuade people to do things without them realising that they were being persuaded. Of course, it's wonderful when people volunteer to do things, but sometimes a helpful nudge is required. I remember on a number of occasions walking away from a conversation with John and suddenly realising that I'd agreed to take on something quite major and having a bit of a... It seems to me that John used his powers of persuasion to great effect, usually resulting in a job well done, but often also to the benefit of the person who'd been persuaded. He had a marvellous instinct for who would be the right person to take on a task, and somehow he was able to inspire that person with confidence so that, however hesitant, they would be able to do things because he thought that they could. My personal example of this was the live Christmas BBC broadcast from St Philip's. John asked me to be responsible for the children and the teenagers who'd be doing the Bible readings. I was to help them prepare the readings and help them learn how to project. No problem there, absolutely my comfort zone, happy Shona. Fast forward to a few days before the broadcast and the BBC have arrived and apparently the combined content isn't long enough and so an adult reader is now required. John appears at my side with the director and 10 minutes later I'm walking home with my heart pounding and a voice in my head telling me that within a few short days I am going to have to read live on TV on Christmas morning. To this day I don't know whether John had always planned for me to do this but had suspected that with time to deliberate I'd probably have run for the hills. As it was I was just swept along with the feeling of just doing a job that needed to be done and I was given a, given a wonderful opportunity to play a part in an unforgettable day. That Christmas was so special. All the usual services on Christmas Eve went ahead, as well as a dress rehearsal for the following day. John was adamant that whatever circus was happening around us, this was our Christmas at St Philip's, and it needed to feel as normal as was possible. John led from the front and did an amazing job of ignoring the lights, cables, Signals from the director and floor manager, the musical conductor and string quartet in the chancel, the brass musicians in the gallery, etc, etc. His quiet confidence that all would be well had the effect of making sure that it was all well. No one could have known John without knowing his wonderful rapport with children. And never, never did it shine out more brightly than on that Christmas morning. I've set the scene already, but now we add in the children. Oh, and this is the bit that no one can rehearse or predict. A group of children and the presents that they've just received that morning. 
Now we all know the old theatre adage of never work with children and animals. Well, if John had followed that, we wouldn't have had the wonderful, warm and charming moments that we're going to show you now. Beautiful. That's a beautiful... What is it? A teddy. A teddy. Oh, that looks interesting. What is it? Personal stereo. A personal stereo. And what's that? An electronic game. An electronic game. Well done. Hold up the things you've got and let me see because I can't talk to you. Look at that. A helicopter. What's that you've got on that bicycle? Tell me that. Who's that? Cindy. Is that Cindy on the bicycle? Gosh, and who have you? What's her name? Tiny Tears. Tiny Tears. I remember Tiny Tears when I was a wee boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see she's looking better than I am. <laughs> These are funny glasses. What do they do? They're window wipers. They're window wipers. Can you, the, the, can you put them on and make them work? Let me see. Put them on and let me see. Oh, that's beautiful. Would they fit me, do you think? This is the very thing I need. There we are. <laughs> Jolly good. I'm going to come and borrow them. <laughs> for this but I bet you've all recognised your children or friends of your children and I'm happy to say that our technical whiz at the back, Jamie McDonald, was actually one of the kids that you saw on the screen there. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that last Sunday when we were all here just having a little rehearsal um, and the, the pictures weren't up on the screen but the audio was running and I just heard John's voice reverberating around St Phillips one more time. I was a basket case. <laughs> I first met John when, like Gavin, I was on the vacancy committee that visited Kilmarnock High to hear him, again courtesy of, or on the recommendation of Bobby. I remember that his children's address was concerned with a small boy who had been lost in a supermarket. However, the message within the words has long been forgotten. John, I remember, however, was an excellent storyteller and after dinner speaker, and I recall approaching him in 1992 and asking if he would do an after dinner speech for an international conference which I was arranging in Edinburgh to celebrate 100 years of horticulture at the Royal Botanic Garden. He said, yes, I'll, I'll do that, um, provided you come round to the manse for a chat. Now, going to the manse for a chat was always dangerous. <laughs> I made it even worse because I took a bottle of malt whiskey. <laughs> John's favourite tipple at that time was Laphroaig, which was really quite a specialist taste. After a few glasses and a long conversation, I remember staggering home, rather unsteady, and having no recollection of what it was we'd spoken of. <laughs> Come the night of the dinner, and sitting on the edge of my seat, I was worried but I needn't have been. John delivered one of the most wonderful, humorous, and well-mannered after-dinner speeches I have ever heard. At the conference dinner, there were students from a cross-section, wide cross-section of British horticulture, uh, and also from international horticulture. And he managed somehow to include most of them, if not many of them, many of them, if not most of them, in his address. He had the ability to assimilate and store conversational material and then recycle it and deliver it with wit and always with a twinkle in his eye. He loved jokes and laughter. John had the ability to see the funny side of most things and I uh, well remember a conversation uh, which I had with him when we were out on a Bible class weekend. We were standing talking about spoonerisms and he suggested that it would be a terrible thing to have a name like Fanny Cartwright. <laughs> Come on, you're a little quicker than that. <laughs> and John would heave with laughter after saying things like that. John could make people relax. It was a skill that came from experience in counselling. He loved company. And attendance at evening parties at the bands, as we've heard already, were always interesting, to say the least. You never knew what would happen. Party games, conversations about how couples met, telling of unknown facts, 
and always seasoned with laughter and good humour. Now, Jill and I often play a game which is about when, when we are meeting people for the first time and we try to establish common contact, possibly after about five or six questions. And I have to say it often works. When John attended the civil receptions which I'd held for the conference I was talking about, that he was in his element because he went round and he managed to ferret out from the people in that room all the facts that he needed for this conference speech. He also found an acquaintance, or it may have been a relative, from Canada, who he had, who had listened to him at one of the burnt suppers that he had presented there. He also reckoned that if you put three fishermen in the same room of 50 or 60 people, that within 10 minutes they would have met in one particular corner. Such was his ability to deal or to realise what people would do. Now for many years I have been speaking on a, a topic which is called Plants of the Bible and it was initiated, I have to say, by Glyn Taverner. And when you go and speak to a group about this and you mention Glyn Taverner, there's one or two people who will not. If you go and speak to them and say, John Weir Cook, there's an avalanche of nods. Everybody seemed to know this man. John had a network of friends as wide as one would expect from a well-traveled fellow. We've seen a portion of the television production, which was our own entry into Songs of Praise. The director on that day was a gentleman by the name of Stuart Miller, whom I've met in my days with Beach Grove Garden, still a television director. In the local horticultural society which I belong to, there's a gentleman by the name of Alan McLaren, a member of the society. We were in conversation the other night and I said that we were having this service for John and he said, I know John Beercook. I was a member of the clinical theology group, which he was a part of. And we also in the audience today have somebody else who was a member of that clinical theology group, whom I just learned about on Sunday night in the Ormley when we were discussing in the book club, and that is Jeanette Fenton. So his circle of friends is wide, and we are still discovering it. Matthew <coughs> will speak later about John's love of Burns, and he was a well-known speaker on Burns and on the Burns circuit, and I had been asked to give an immortal memory, and I was petrified. It was the Dunn's Burn Club, for goodness sake, one of those ones which is held in high esteem. And I didn't know what to do, so I spoke to John, and he said, oh, look, don't panic, you can do it. You know, the way he instills confidence in people, that was it. And then he said, come round, I have a store of immortal memories on the computer. You can take whichever ones you like, <laughs> marry them together, and call it your own, which is what he did. And it was so generous in that respect. His sense of humour, his chesty chuckle, his kindness, his total commitment to all things Christian will always stay with me. Shona mentioned John's powers of persuasion. He was a difficult man to say no to. His intellect enabled him to be streets ahead of you when it came to arguing through a case. He had also, as she said, the ability to see talent in others. Witness the encouragement he gave to Jennifer Booth and to Karen Watson in their personal journeys through faith. And they, of course, are fulsome in their praise and encouragement, or, or of the encouragement he gave to them. John's personal faith was very strong, but then came tested times. By 1998, John had begun to plan for his retirement. That was before the fire. On that night, Thursday, December the 3rd, 1998, I was doing what I usually do on a Thursday night, having my tea before setting out to drama group. The phone went, ah, oh, somebody's saying they're going to be late, I thought, but no. It was my friend Sandra, who lives just across the road there, telling me that the church was on fire.
Thus began a night of tears and despair, as we saw the fire, fanned by a strong wind, destroy the place which had played such a large part in all our lives. It was left a smouldering shell. The damage caused by the fire could have been much worse. The strategy employed by the firefighters as they fought to save as much of the building as they could was admirable and left us with most of the masonry walls intact. That cold December night, John, though he must have been as devastated as the rest of the spectators, church members and community alike, did what he always did, thought of others and worked the crowd. He went round each teary group and hugged and cuddled, comforted and encouraged. John and the newly appointed session clerk, the indefatigable Elise Rutherford, ably led a restoration committee. Amidst the tears and upset, we realised that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to update the sanctuary, levelling the floor, increasing the size of the vestibule, installing a new heating system and getting rid of the sticky pews. St Philip's has always been a busy place and room had to be found for all the various groups to meet. Within weeks, an amazing amount of organisation had taken place and John was soon leading our services in the church hall, instilling a decided feeling of optimism amongst the congregation a huge band of volunteers always on hand to reset the hall to suit the ongoing activities. Many people will recall seeing John proudly sporting his personalised hard hat as he surveyed the new construction work. I well remember at midnight on the night of the millennium when John encouraged and organised church members and friends to form an unbroken circle round the outside of the still fire damaged church, down the steps to the main hall door, along the corridor, back up the steps into the centenary hall and back outside. <coughs> the church bell was rung once, then we all held hands and sang Auld Lang Syne together. The restoration of St Philip's proved to be more worrying and stressful and took much longer than any of us could have imagined and of course delayed John's retirement but allowed him to retire happily after a job well done. It was a long wait until the church was rededicated but at last with great thanksgiving and excitement a triumphant John led his congregation into the wonderful fresh green sanctuary as Harry on the bagpipes and Fiona on the organ played Highland Cathedral. It seems appropriate to now sing Thou art before me Lord, thou art behind to the tune of Highland Cathedral.
Um, John set up a, a youth fellowship, which seems entirely appropriate because he was always kind of childlike, I think, John. Um, I always imagine him like this as well, with his hands in his pockets. Uh, I love that, that kind of, I don't know, that kind of relaxed approach that he had. But he, he invited, there was a group of us in our late teens, early twenties, went up to the manse, I think once a week um, in the evening. And John, we would discuss religious and philosophical affairs. And at some point, someone in the group suggested that, that it would help if we were maybe in a pub or there was alcohol nearby, and that was quickly adopted. <laughs> um, so we, we continued to do that. He then took us off to Aaron. We went for a, a youth fellowship retreat to Aaron. There was prayer, there was hill walking, there was whiskey. Um, and, and he taught us bridge. Um, and from these little seeds, all sorts of things grew um, because the kind of group of friends um, are still to this day a very strong fellowship and we maybe don't talk as much about religion and philosophy as we did, but we, uh, but you know, there are, there are marriages and children. Uh, I mean, my sister, on, on, on leaving home and going to Aberdeen University, uh, you know, heady with, uh, with being away from her parents, about to grasp university life, she went and joined the Bridge Club. <laughs> no self-respecting 19-year-old does this. Um, <laughs> but this is John's fault. Um, and uh, as a result of this, she met her future husband, Roger. Um, and, you know, John managed to complete that circle a few years later. Um, by marrying them on a mist-bound Colton Hill. Um, and now Robbie and Emily have come along, so, you know, really they're John's fault as well. So we can, <laughs> we can blame John for quite a few things, I think. Um, the, other, the other thing uh, that we've heard mentioned about is Burns. Um, and we know that, that, that John loved Burns, and he was a kind of much-celebrated speaker, and in much in demand in various countries. I think he did Burns talks of uh, Burns talks, Burns suppers around the world uh, and, and various after dinner speaking. Um, and so we thought we'd mark that um, also with a, with, a, with a bit of a song in a second. Um, Burns and John seems a perfect fit for me, the warmth, the wit, the softness for a dram, um, you know, it just it seems to go perfectly together. And apparently um, his favourite uh, Burns song was indeed uh, All Lang Syne. Um, and apparently the reasons for that is that some of the later, maybe lesser known verses, uh, they talk of kind of childhood spent picking daisies on the hills or paddling in the burn and, and that those friendships endure despite the many years or the distances that come in between and that just sounds like John right there. Um, so uh, I'm going to sing Old Lang Syne but I'd really love you to join in the chorus or indeed as much of any of the rest of it as you wish to. Um, the words for the chorus will remarkably appear in a second up there. And uh, if in the final verse um, you feel the urge to grab a hand of a trusty fear, then go for it. But we 
we've wandered money a weary fit sin of For deal for me personally and for my family over the years and it was a great honour to be involved in the planning of the activities to celebrate his retirement as a minister and his years of service to St Philip's. We wanted to hold an event that would cover, cover some of the great occasions during his ministry and decide on an evening of song with excerpts from all the shows and concerts during his tenure performed by all the choirs and drama groups. Even with this, we felt we needed something that would focus more on John's life and came up with the idea to do our own This Is Your Life, based on the popular television show. Gavin Booth was an automatic choice to be the presenter, and despite being busy with other commitments, he readily agreed. The next task was to obtain all the content and guests, and this would never have happened without the support and help of Elizabeth Cook who supplied contact details and photographs. We had family members giving us an idea of what it was like to grow up with John, school friends talking about school life and colleagues from the ministry. It was testament to the high regard and esteem that John was held in that everyone we contacted to participate readily said yes and even changed appointments to be there. John had no idea this was happening. I was surprised when Gavin walked out and up to him with the red folder. I'll say goodbye now and leave with the applause that John received the evening when he first came in. Probationers around since I've landed here, and 
and it probably is well known that probationers will share me stories about what's coming vacant, what is vacant, what they'd like to be vacant. And certainly I remember him as a probationer sitting up at Palmerston Place, which is where the presbytery meet, up in the nosebleed seats up there. And when John came up to say farewell to presbytery, what a magic spell he wove as he talked about his time in the Edinburgh Presbytery and his time as a minister. With people laughing like they'd probably never laugh and shouldn't laugh at Presbytery. <laughs> and you could just kind of feel, you could just feel the good naturedness, the humor just oozing from the very front all the way up into the stratosphere itself. And certainly I remember talking to, to one of my previous supervisors and saying, you know, you know, St. Philip's has kind of come up and it's vacant and, you know, it'd be a bit of a long shot, but, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. He said, well, they had their head screwed on right at St. Philip's. That was a comment he made, and I thought, that's really interesting. So what he was saying, essentially, is it's a healthy... Oh, George is going like that, so obviously, <laughs> obviously I've got that wrong. But what he was saying is that's a very, very healthy congregation. And certainly once I landed here after paying very heavy bribes, in, I remember um, coming along and, and I was much more, much more interested in kind of the quiet communion services and things like that. And, and John came along to one of the first evening communion services that we had. And of course, it was, it was always the, the, very, the very friendly, the very open, gregarious was a, was a word that Gavin used. But what was interesting as he came in to this quiet sanctuary, I almost had the sense of a homecoming of sorts. In a sense, this was his home, but it was more than that, I think. It wasn't just St. Philip's the home. It was the home of faith. The home of being a part of something that was so much bigger and broader than himself. And a time, I think it was Hunter that, 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 that alluded to this, that time to sit and reflect in his own way the faith that was so crucially important to him. And he was nothing, he was always, always so gentlemanly and very, very encouraging to me because sometimes there can be just a little bit of a rub between those who had gone and the new kid on the block, but he was nothing if not supportive. And most especially when we gathered at the old parish in their cafe as the fraternal, but of course when there were female ministers there, it became the holy huddle. So we would sit there and we would talk about things that happened. Um, and John would talk about all the books that he had read with this great enthusiasm, this great support. And it was always a sense that this was in a way a wise elder statesman who had been through so much and could share stories and insights that were so valuable to other ministers. And one of the best lines, I hope I have it right, one of his favorite thinkers, I think, was John Shelby Spawn, um, a very liberal um, bishop from the U.S. And one of his comments about the Christian faith is it's a bit like a public swimming pool. It's always louder in the shallow end. <laughs> which said to me precisely what John was about. He was lively, he was social, and yet there was this incredible depth there as well. And so as we gather here, it made me think, in a sense, I'm part of a long tradition. Before me was John, before John was Peter Cameron, and then there was Glyn Taverner, and was it Adams, and then Nicholson, da 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 But now it's not just that story. <coughs> We have a stream from two other congregations who are coming in here as well, McDougall, Webster, Patterson, Buchanan, part of this real, real chord of a strong, strong Christian faith, which will continue for it is only 2,000 years young. But what I remember most vividly is on, well, yesterday, we were here at Messy Church as Tom and Alice were flinging cardboard boxes around. Well, no, you're crawling on them. No, no, Tom was rugby tackling a tower of cardboard boxes, which was supposed to be the walls of Jerusalem, but quickly turned into Tower of Babel and a bridge and all the rest of it. Alice, I think, was creating another, the tallest tower in the world. And then on <coughs> Thursday, I think it was, Tower Bank were in here for their Burns lunch. And how appropriate that Tom was the MC. Tom, tell me if I've got this right, played the violin, and you played Auld Lang Syne as part of that? That's right, I got that, still have a memory. And recited a poem, My Granny. Is that right? I've got it all right. Here was Tom in the church doing burns. How nice.
Sarah was here, Elizabeth was here, and Noelle was at Tower Bank, and she was keeping an eye on Alice as well. How much John would have loved that. How much just knowing that this church, of which he was such a part, is still playing such a vital role in all of our lives, in the life of the community, and in the life of his family. And it's a pity Peter can't be here, but Sarah was telling me, of course, we got a text from him as well. So he is here in spirit, if not just electronically as well. It has been truly an honor, a little bit of pressure, following someone like John Weir Cook, both the support of the family and all the congregation and the faith that gathers us all in. My goodness, what a joyful opportunity. I've been asked to do a closing prayer, and before I do that, I have some M, M crib notes here. M, there is in the retire collection um, this afternoon. In the, the vestibule, there are two communion plates on tables, and this is for Macmillan, who were so important to John and the family um, more recently. And also, um, John's brother, uh, Malcolm, is that correct? Um, did I get that right? Has sponsored a, a well, sponsored a bust of John, in, which is over in the windowsill here, just before the door into the centenary hall. And there's a bit of needlework there that's been done by the nimble thimbles. So do take a moment while you're getting your teas and coffees to have a wee look at that. Um, a good, lovely memento of John and his time at St. Philip's. Our closing prayer. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that we have been able to gather here this afternoon to remember John and his years of service in this place. We give you thanks for the call that was extended to him. As a people and congregation felt a tie, a bond through the Holy Spirit, that working in harmony with John, they could together respond to your calling to be disciples in this community and in this world. We give you thanks, God, for the depth of his faith, the eloquence and the humor of his words, the honesty of his doubts and his trials and faith, but yet these growing into the wisdom of his insights. We give you thanks for the lightness of his touch as he worked with people, and the dedication and thought and detail in the times of great challenges and in his hard work. We give you thanks for humility that so often led him to you as the fountain of wisdom and to the writings of generations of thinkers, believers, followers, and of the faithful. We give you thanks, God, that in our common life together, bound through our commitment to Christ, our remembrance and thanksgiving for John and his life is at the same time a recognition that through our lives, through the life of this congregation, through our belief in the communion of saints, there is indeed everlasting life in and through you. So as we come towards the end of this service, a service of music and song and speaking and remembering of laughter and of tears, led by just a few of those who knew John, may we once again commit ourselves to the faith which sustained him all of his days for perhaps those seeds planted in our own hearts, these are the legacy of which he would be most proud and would be most grateful, the fruit of faith, which has and will bring so much joy, so much hope, so much appreciation to so many people in this place and all around the world for his life, for his ministry, for his character, God, we give you our heartfelt thanks. Amen. <coughs> <coughs>
As Stuart has indicated, you've been very welcome to stay on, have a, a cup of tea and chat, and probably reminisce about John's ministry and John's friendship. We're going to finish on the screens with a, a song that was written for the reopening of the church after the fire, when it reopened, uh, with sponsorship from the Green Party, as you can see. <laughs> uh, the, the song, I wrote, I wrote the lyrics and my friend Nancy Kent wrote the music of Blaze of Glory.